All righty. Well, um, it's great to be in Destin uh, after a couple of years now of the, the talk of being in the SEC to uh, to be here now and, and to be around all of y'all and Commissioner Sankey and, and all that the SEC is now. It's it's great to be here and, and looking forward to uh, this partnership, not only with the SEC, but with the other universities. So it's great to be here. Sark, can you safely and effectively um, you know, go with an 85-man roster? Well, I mean, I think that's the challenge of that is adjusting, right? And, and I've said this all along, like we're in this era of college football where we have to continually adapt. It's, it's from the moment I got this job at Texas, we were still almost operating under the old ways. Mm -hmm. And here comes the transfer portal. Here comes NIL. Here comes conference realignment. Uh, now here comes a new settlement. Now there's talk of, of potential roster size being 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 reduced. Um, but through it all, you have to adapt, right? And, and if we don't adapt, we, we aren't going to be here, right? And so I think that the end, um, if that's the number, that's the number. We, we have to adapt, we have to adjust, and, and we got to figure out the, the best way to put our players in the best position to have success. Is that the impression you get that that's going to be the result? I don't know yet. We, ha we haven't met yet, so I'm not certain. Coach, how much does your NFL background kind of help you in this modern era of college football? It seems like it's just like free agency. It seems like there's like, you know, NIL and all those kind of, how much does that help you where, where you're at now? I, mean, I think I think it's been helpful. Um, you know, for us in the transfer portal, we, we do view that as kind of free agency for us and, and where we have gaps or holes in our roster, where we, where we can fill those things in. Um, I, I do think understanding um, the temperature in your locker room and you know who's making what uh, and and keeping that that culture the right way. Now we're going to player to coach you know coach to player communication, which is very similar to to how it was in the NFL as well. Now there's talk of um, reporting player injuries and things for the week, and so. There's definitely a shift, right? And which I don't think is a bad thing. The NFL has has done extensive homework and research on a lot of these things. Um, and so if that's the direction we go in, we just try to fall back on some of our experiences to, to do the best that we can. Outside of roster size, is there another topic that you're really keen on talking with other coaches about here? Um, you know, I'm, I'm always curious about our recruiting calendar because there's been so many adjustments and changes to our recruiting calendar over the last, I guess, 24 months um, of when we could call, when we can't call, when we can when we can do uh, school visits, when we can do in-home visits and to, to when our signing days and when our dead periods. And so um, I'm hopeful. I, I think we're, we're trying to make progress there, but I'm hopeful that we're continually trying to keep in mind of all parties involved, the student athletes, the assistant coaches, um, of, of what it looks like to to ensure that that we're doing it not just the easy way, but what's probably the best way for our future. Do you, uh, this is a follow-up, do you favor the idea of having the portal open after signing day in December for the high school players? Um, I would prefer that. You know, I, I, it's a lot. And what I, I think one thing that I learned for myself a year ago, being a head coach in the college football playoff, I've been in the playoff before as an assistant, but being a head coach, I, it definitely got challenging uh, as you're trying to do in-home visits with high school kids in December, but yet you've got players populating the portal at, at, the, <laughs> at the same time, and we're still trying to go compete for a national championship. And so you're trying to game plan, and we've got our own – We've got our own team that we're, that we're trying to work with and so if we could compartmentalize that a little bit i think that would be that would be healthy not only for us as coaches but i think giving the high school players their opportunity because i i do think a lot of those kids at the end maybe lost scholarships because they thought they were going to a school but in the end school a saw a kid get in the portal they took him instead of the high school kids so if we can if we can you know compartmentalize that a little bit i think it'd be helpful Steve, is there a way of doing these availability reports without coaches finding a way to game the system or cheat the system? Find us. That's what they do in the NFL. I, I'm a big believer in this. The NFL has figured a lot of this stuff out already. They've already had to live through all of these things that have occurred. 
So we don't have to try to recreate the wheel so much, right? If, if, if I try to game the system and I don't report a guy and, and so on and so forth, find us. That, that, it, we all like the money that we make. And so that's a, that's a really simple way to get us to adhere to the rules. You know, the administrators were here last year, but does this all make it seem much more real? being here now and representing the SEC. It's pretty exciting. Um, you know, we've been we've been out and about all, all, all May, and I had a chance to just stop in the office um, Sunday before I came out, and the SEC logo is getting put down in DKR right now. So it's all happening. It's all becoming a reality, um, and it's exciting. It, it really is. This, this conference is amazing. Like I said, as an assistant, um, I had some great years here uh, when I was with Alabama and Coach Saban. Uh, I love the competitive spirit of the SEC, and, and I, I think about that in really three levels. I think about the coaches, I think about the athletes, and I think about the fan bases. Uh, there's, there's a real competitive spirit in the SEC, and uh, week in and week out, you know, the, the challenges that it, that it poses for you, whether it's when you're playing on the road, whether it's game planning against some of the best coaches in, in our sport, or whether it's you know competing against some of the best athletes in, in college football, uh, great challenges, but that's that's why we do what we do. Is it gonna be weird in there to not see Coach Saban after so long? Uh, I've never sat in a meeting with him, so I don't know if it'll be so weird for me. I bet it might be weird for y'all, I, I don't know. Uh, but but we'll see. I'm, I'm just curious to see if he stayed here the night and then, or did he fly home and fly back? Cause he, I want to know if he and Miss Terry had a bunk, had two bunk beds in their room. I don't know. I, just, I wonder if that, if that happened. Coach Sark, how, how do you think Coach Saban's handling retirement? I mean, he's obviously going to be still involved with the program there. Yeah. Kalen DeBoer's been open door. Come yeah. talk to me. It's got to still be a little bit weird for him, but have you had any conversations? With I've spoken to him a little bit. I think he's doing great. You know, I, I thought his analysis for the NFL draft was was incredible. Um, I've even, you know, I've had a chance to visit with a couple different NFL teams and coaches. They even commented on, you know, just some of the the, the thoughts he had on on different players. I think he's going to be great on game day um, in in being an ambassador for our sport, and that's something that he did at Alabama as the head coach and really when he was at LSU and now he's even got a bigger stage uh, to I think again be, be an ambassador for college football and, and do it the right way. Coach you, coach, you never really complain about the transfer portal, you don't never complain about NIL. Why does those topics not seem to bother you? Well because I, I, I'm a believer in this, like change is inevitable and I think we have to change with change. And, and my, my biggest thing is this, as long as we're all playing by the same rules, it just is what it is. And so I just don't, I try not to spend a lot of time complaining, you know, and, and I just, I'm, I'm more solution oriented than I am point out the problem with it. And so, okay, these are the rules, this is what it is. All right, how do we, how do we best navigate through this um, to put ourselves in the best position to have some success? So you said, as long as we all play by the rules, the NCAA had been very good at enforcing its own rules. There's talk now about a new mechanism, a new enforcement right. staff. What's right. realistic to expect for a level? Well, the one thing I'll say, and I know the NCAA is one thing, but I think the SEC does a really good job of that. I think Commissioner Sankey does a heck of a job of that. I think it starts there first. Um, we, we've, got a, we've got a lot of great coaches in that room that I'm about to go into, and we've got great leadership okay with our athletic directors and commissioner sankey and his team um and in the end wh whatever they they define for us the, of the umbrella that we're supposed to operate under they'll start that policing mechanism to make sure that we're all playing by the same rules and then where the ncaa goes with it and and then in the in the new way that they're going to get to it we'll find out what that is but i think it has to start within our own conference before we can worry too much about from a national level What's your historical perspective on the game with AM and your relationship with Mike Elkin? Yeah, I'm, I'm excited. Uh, I'll be honest with you. You know, the, I've been part of some great rivalries uh, in college football. And I know there was so much talk about realignment. And, and I know realignment looks different for, for, for every school. But for us, we gained, we gained two rivals back, right? We're playing Arkansas again, which, which is great for Texas Longhorn and Longhorn Nation. 
we get a and m back and so you're talking about the, the game of a and m you're talking about houses divided you're talking about you know decades of, of tremendous games and thanksgiving weekend and so uh to get that game back i know we're looking forward to it i know i'm sure a and m is too I, i've got a ton of respect for coach elko um we competed against one another you know when he was a defensive coordinator at a and m and i was an offensive coordinator at alabama um and he, he He's got really good scheme, really good players, and, and I think he's going to do a really good job there. You mentioned player-coach communication. How much did y'all kind of experiment with that this spring, and how beneficial is that for someone like yourself that is the primary play caller uh, for the team? Yeah, we um, you know, we did it all spring long with the quarterbacks. Um, we'll we'll get more into it with our defensive players uh, when we get back. Um, you know, I, I think the, the the first thought about communicating is everyone thinks that that's going to stop signal stealing yeah. well the, the what stops signal stealing is don't signal anymore get in the huddle right and so that's in the nfl that's why they use that communication is because they huddle they talk to their team they go to the line of scrimmage they run the play there is no signal <clears throat> um and so i you know i just don't think everybody needs to understand like <clears throat> Just because you can talk to the quarterback but still signal, that's not going to stop the guys on the other side from watching your signals and by the second quarter know if you're going to run it or throw it, if you're blitzing or you're playing cover two, whatever whatever it is. And so I think that's where we have to wrap our brains around as coaches at the University of Texas is how much do we prefer to huddle? How much do we prefer to be no huddle? What's our mechanism to to communicate effectively when we are talking to the player with, with the earpiece in? And so th there's going to be a learning curve for a lot of people here because the college game is a little bit different than the NFL. There isn't the, – people don't go no huddle. They're not going as fast as they can go. And so how do you manage that from a defensive perspective? And then who do we want to be offensively, all right, to minimize some of the signaling that we have to do? Commissioners, we talk about roster size. Commissioner Sankey said initial reaction from some coaches he heard from was they were a little fired up when they heard it might be changing. I mean, in your initial reaction, were you fired up or did you just kind of like Well, take it? I, I think in the end, we all would like more players, right? And I, I think for me, my, my biggest concern about when I initially heard 85 scholarship, 85 scholarship players and that was going to be our roster limit, well, that's – I've got 35 walk-ons on our team. We don't have this enormous roster at Texas. We have 120 players on our roster, but that's 35 walk-ons. And then what happens to those walk-ons? And what about the stories of all the great walk-ons over time that really shape a lot of what college football is about? My own son is a walk-on on our football team. So th th those types of things to me, um, I'm hopeful we can find a common ground on something that is a reasonable number. Um, again, I'm not, I'm not, uh, opposed to change. Change is going to happen, okay? But hopefully we can find a reasonable number to where um, we still feel like we can operate at a high level as coaches and for our players uh, and, and, and then still continue that tradition of, of walk-on football players on our teams. Got time for one last one. Another question about change. Um, how concerned are you and your peers about potential lawsuits from players from NIL? I'm not very concerned. You know, I, I think there's a, there's a way that you know, we go about our business that, that we, we try to do things, continually do things above board. And if a lawsuit does come your way, um, that you feel very confident in, in the process of which that you, you did it. Um, but like anything, okay, when, when, when things happen, sometimes with change, we don't see the unintended consequences that come with change. And that's why I'm always hesitant to rush to a decision or a judgment without doing all of our due diligence on what it could look like. And NIL has been really good. And I'm, and, I, and I'm happy for our student athletes that they get that. I'm happy about the new settlement with the NCAA. I think it's great for the student athletes, but we got to make sure that we're doing our due diligence on the unintended consequences. One of which lawsuits from players to, uh, to coaches and universities, because that's a, uh, that's that's hefty on a lot of people when those types of things come that way. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.